I'm waiting for Michael Peters to say something now about how he would describe my work. So, <laughs> um, more formally, and I say this uh, because in my mind, being a visitor to Itara, uh, this is crucial. Uh, ina iwi, ina mana, kato kato, tena kato, tena kato, tena kato. This is my second time at Pisa. My first was in 1981 or 82, and it was in Palmerston North. Um, it's interesting, to say the least. Uh, my introduction to the world of educational philosophy and to critical policy studies was that conference in many ways. So I come here with joy and respect for my teachers, those of you may also know I was the external on Graham Smith's dissertation. Uh, so there are other reasons for being here. Uh, but also I want to express a different kind of thanks. And that is, uh, as some of you know, I am from now the state of Wisconsin. It has a very, very large First Nation program and population. And it is the home of uh, the racial contract which is we will give social democratic forms to all people who are blonde and come from Europe of a particular time period. And then we will pretend to give social democratic forms to worthy people. But since indigenous people somehow never get on that list, when I say that it is a university on stolen land, I am laughed at. Coming here reminds me of, in part of the struggles that are continuing, but also of the victories that are not in my own state. I want to say that publicly, because I think in a time of neoliberal restructuring, when it is now possible to say the unsayable and do the undoable again in so many nations, coming here reminds me of victories, not just defeats. So a public thank you to my colleagues from Māori nations and South Pacific nations as well. Okay. So I want to talk about a new project, um, a project that combines some of my work in social theory uh, with some gritty materialities of what is going on in education. Uh, the last 20 years, I've set aside a particular project, and that project is to say, to answer the question, can education actually change society? Uh, I don't like the answers to it at all. I think this is a day of cynicism. And I think cynicism only helps those people who wish to reconstruct our lives. Uh, and I've spent the last 20 years with three or four books trying to answer the question, what can be done? And I think that question is answered all the time by people who are on the right. So this, I want to talk a, a bit about that former project that surfaced in uh, educating the right way. Um, by the way, uh, they're on sale for $800 more than they hoped. <laughs> no. um, actually not. As some of you know, my wife Rima and I uh, accept no royalties for our books. Uh, the book, the royalties go to social mobilizations and social movements. So uh, you can buy the book, but then you're helping this year the violence against women's shelters around the corner from our houses, okay? Um, so I, I, want, I want to then rehearse a bit about the kind of project about showing how the right has understood Gramsci's point that the struggle for dominance requires a struggle for common sense, and they've been damn good at it. And I think that requires serious theoretical apparatuses to understand it, but I think the question has already been answered. Can education change society? Of course it can. The question is, can it be changed in more progressive directions? And part of what I want to say actually not responds to, but takes seriously some of the arguments that Gerd was making yesterday, and I think quite a profoundly interesting piece about the way in which the left thinks about education as simply a response to particular economic forms, and I think that's an error. I think education is deeply complicated, and I don't think that the metaphor we want to use is the metaphor only of reproduction. And I think to look at teaching as simply an act of reproduction 
actually falls into the hands of those people who have a neoliberal agenda. And I think that is a dangerous position to take. So Gerda, I want to thank you for raising that, whether you meant it or not, in terms of my terms. I think that much of the debate that's going on is about that. So um, I normally do not use PowerPoint. But because this is a multinational group, uh, I am doing what I would normally do when I'm in China, which is I will use PowerPoint because I know that English is often the second or third or fourth language of people here. I speak two languages, the language of Wisconsin and the language of working class New Jersey, which means that I always start a sentence or end it with a word that begins with F. Um, uh, but, um, Food, food. Now, I know what you. I, I know what you were thinking. Okay. All right. So, the initial problem is this: Can education assist in social transformation? What is our role? And our is a word of exclusion as well as inclusion. What is our role as researchers, scholars, and educators committed to social justice and answering and acting on this? And my my answer in the latest book. Uh, a book called uh, Can Education Change Society Appropriately is, well, yes, it can, but it depends on a lot of hard, collective, and individual work. And that is documented every time I am here in South Auckland, as an example, but not only there. <laughs> so I want us again you know, to, to understand that there are ways of thinking about this. The two, in my mind, that are most important, the two con the conceptual apparatus I want to use to think about this. Uh, the first two are what's called relational analysis and repositioning. So relational analysis says this. The world is not the simulacrum that postmodernists love us to talk about. What is overt may not be the reality. It is the deeper structures that go on. So I'm in debate with particular theoretical traditions about this. Let me give an example of what I mean by relational analysis. Here is my PowerPoint. It was done at the University of Wisconsin in my office. I walked up the stairs in the teacher education building at the University of Wisconsin. I turned on the light, the light went on. I turned on the computer, the computer went on, and I began to type this PowerPoint. That's actually not what happened. Yes, Michael Apple walked up the stairs in the teacher education building. Yes, I turned on the light. Yes, I turned on the computer. Yes, I began to type, but in the city of Madison, Wisconsin, as Jeff knows from looking out over from his office when he was there, and mine is a coal plant. We burn coal to produce electricity. And for me to do the most progressive work I can think of, I just had an anonymous relationship with the miners, men and women who died in order for my electricity to go on. So I want, that is the, those are the glasses I use to try and think through what is the relationship between knowledge, power, and particular kinds, not just the political economies, but you can't think about it unless you think about also the structural formations that underpin even progressive work. That doesn't make us complicitous. What it does is to remind us that we have debts to pay. I don't like the language of complicity. I think it actually is an overstatement, and it actually removes people from their social responsibilities in some ways. So I want us to think that, think connectively. The other is the more difficult task, and that is repositioning. Whether I like it or not, I am a straight white man from the imperial center. Right? And in my nation, as well as many others, the empire continues to come home. Because of that, I must try and see the world through the eyes of those people not in my position, knowing how damn difficult that is. So as a man, you'll forgive these essentializing categories. I know that they can be deconstructed. Right? As a man, I must think through the, at the world of what it's like to be a young woman teacher going into a school where the kids are going crazy because there's no, nothing for them there. And they already know what the future looks like. There are no jobs. Okay? I must see the world that way. I must also see the world as if I were a person of color. And as the father of an African-American young man, it's not hard to do for me, actually, since he was pushed out of school. 
Okay? So the idea of repositioning then is an epistemological project. You know, it has its bearing in feminist epistemological forms of standpoint theory of George Lukács and his work in history and class consciousness, that if you do not have a stake as high in the society, you tend, underline that word, tend to be able to see the world in a more accurate way, though the right has transformed our understanding of that. So I want to understand then, what does it mean to do relational analysis, to try as hard as one can to engage in the act of repositioning, and how has the right reached in and grabbed that so that we forget the act of repositioning, so that white men now call themselves the new oppressed, which I find very interesting, and it's part of a creative, ideological, and pedagogic project. And I want to think about social mobilizations as pedagogic, that there are pedagogic projects that change people's identities and pull people, as Althusser would say, interpolate people, convince them to come under the umbrellas of dominant groups. So, that they, so the language of the oppressed is then disarticulated from its ori origination in social mobilizations among oppressed groups and reappropriated by dominant groups. So that's been the project in many ways. And part of that requires, I think, to throw out many of the categories that have been traditional to the left, and that is ideas about false consciousness. There is no such object. I think it's a bad concept, totally. And here I draw from Gramsci, who reminds us that consciousness is fundamentally contradictory. It has elements of good sense and bad sense. No one misunderstands their life totally. Ordinary lives, people are in essence intellectuals of their own lives. That doesn't mean they're correct about this. But it does mean that people have elements of good sense. And the task of dominant groups is to reach in and connect with the elements of good sense. So part of that is required in, in the earlier book, in Educating the Right Way, to look at the way social mobilizations form alliances, what are called new hegemonic blocks, to generate what Gramsci would call crucial, and that is the generation of consent. That people get pulled under the umbrella of dominant groups, new identities are formed, and that requires, for instance, that words with what might be called rich emotional economies, words like democracy, get transformed. And I'll talk a lot more about that tomorrow. It's not the same lecture, I assure you. Um, the first 10 minutes is the same lecture, but I need that in order to provide the foundation for what I want to do for the second half. And I'll be done about midnight. Um, so that wasn't a joke. <laughs> um, but being from, I, and I've ordered pizza for everyone because of that, okay? But being from the belly of the beast, you'll be paying for it for the rest of your lives, so it's okay. Um, okay, uh, so, so part of my ta more taxonomic analysis, let's not fall down, Michael, um, is to say, look, a new hegemonic block has been formed that has shifted education in profoundly powerful ways. And there are four elements of this, and the right has been historically willing to compromise among its tendencies. And the first group is what we have spoken a lot about. And again, Gert and others talked about this, I think, in quite robust ways. And many papers have taken this very, very seriously, from Michael and Tinas to many, many other people here, understand the power of neoliberal agendas. Right? Private is necessarily good. Public is necessarily bad. New identities of what used to be called in social philosophy possessive individualism. And democracy is transformed from thick to thin, okay? So democracy is choice on a market. It's not collective participatory forms, okay? Now that requires a vision of a weak state, and it also establishes in many ways a particular philosophical and epistemological agenda that reduces the range of knowledge, and again, it is an epistemological project, to those things that can be measured, okay? Now, they have made a compromise with a second group, a uh, group that has historically been called neoconservatism. That is, that's a cultural agenda, not necessarily an economic agenda, that we must restore something that never existed in any nation in the world, and that is a common culture. 
that fictive past where we all thought the same. Right? There, there is no nation that has had that. Nations are bonded together through both symbolic and quite bodily violence. And that is the history of nationhood as a modernizing project. And they want a strong state over culture, knowledge, and people's bodies, especially people of color and indigenous people and women. And people who had this horrible tendency to fall in love with people who sort of looked like they did. Okay? So it's a sexual state, it's a gendered state, it's a class and race state. And that means that theories of the state become utterly essential for understanding of these kinds of things. There's a third group that I am actually closest to, oddly enough, epistemologically, and that is what Stuart Hall calls authoritarian populists. This is a group that the people must decide, but there are good people and bad people. These are religious evangelicals and fundamentalists, and I want to be careful about that because I work with religious evangelicals throughout the world, with Islamic women groups, with people in Brazil among the landless movement, and I quote from them, Jesus was the first communist. I am not going to ask about their motivation, I will applaud, okay? But there is this vision, if you will, that God speaks to me, but not to you. God being singular, God being the male figure. Okay, and I think that's, you know, we can see that in, his, in particular visions in Palestine with uh, and a summon of Jewish heritage. It pains me to say this publicly with what I think are war crimes going on given these kinds of things. Okay, and we can see it in the treatment in Afghanistan of women and in the United States in the closing of women's health clinics over the control, women's control over their bodies. Okay. A fourth group, and here I'm arguing about class dynamics. Those of you who know my work know that I've engaged in a good deal of class uh, theory. And here I'll borrow from Basil Bernstein and others. But the new managerial, a particular fraction of the professional and managerial new middle class that believes one simple thing. If it moves in classrooms, measure it. And if it hasn't moved yet, measure it anyway in case it moves tomorrow. <laughs> this also is an epistemological agenda Right? And, uh, but so, so this, I, I've tried to claim in educating the right way, this new hegemonic block has proven that it is perfectly possible to form a large scale social mobilization that changes education as a lever to pry loose other changes in society. All right? Now, given that, what can we do? Who is the we? Right. What can we do as educators, and I would hope activists do, to inter interrupt these ideologies, policies, and tendencies? So I, I want to say there is no doubt already that education is a project, an epistemological project, and a social and economic project, an ideological project. The right has already proven it's possible to transform society and identities through that. So I, I don't find it an interesting question anymore. It's been proven, okay? And I think we give to the right what it wants if we say it's only the economy, stupid. And unless we can change the economy, everything will stay the same. There is no evidence to support that claim, by the way, okay? Revolutionary forms take years. There are cultural preconditions for this. Anyone who has read Marx knows that. And the search for purity is, I think, part of the problem, not part of the solution. And it's inherently a practice of whiteness and deeply inflected by masculinities and visions of particular kinds of labor that we count, which is male labor, not unpaid domestic labor. Okay, so, so what can we do? I want to talk about nine tasks, actually 10, because I added one this morning. I would hope I come out of this with maybe 15, but this is a preliminary list. You know, forgive the taxonomic stuff here, but you know, the entire book, Can Education Change Society, tries to say, what does this look like now? Okay? I must admit, I'm tired of feeling miserable. So I want to be miserable about a set of tasks now that I think the right has done really well, and I think we can learn from them. 
And there's no guarantee of success, but I know there's a guarantee of failure if we don't act on this. All right? And let me remind you that the right would not be so damn angry at education if there hadn't been victories. Okay? So I think that's actually quite important. So there's nine attacks. I'll go through each one. This will be on the examination, so uh, no one leaves this room. I mean, this is neoliberalism. You must constantly give evidence of success. And my salary is based on your performance now. So uh, <laughs> that is Obama's policy in the United States. Okay. Uh, and the state of Victoria and Tony Abbott. And uh, Mr. Little, I'm waiting to see what he's going to say about the Labor Party. And I'm not certain where the Greens fit in this. So I need to be taught later on. All right, so there, there are 10 tasks, OK? The first, you know, say a sentence about each one and then come back and develop the argument. First is describing reality critically, what might be called following biblical sort of sacred texts, bearing witness to negativity, OK? To tell the truth. You'll forgive me, but I do not think that relativism is a useful category. I think it's philosophically suspect and having worked with Jonas Soltis and Arthur Danto and a number of other philosophers for my master's degree at Columbia, uh, I just walk out the room when I hear these arguments. I know that they're very sophisticated, and I know that we believe they're true because they're French. Right? <laughs> but for all of my fleeing ordinary language analysis, I think that it is too easy to subvert the arguments and logic. Okay, so I'm a little worried, which is not to say that Foucault is not absolutely central and brilliant. So my point is, it's where these things, these different epistemological traditions, rub against each other that progress can be made. Okay? All right. So, bearing witness to negativity, telling the truth. Some of that is empirical, some of it is historical. The second is showing spaces for action. The operative concept here is not reproduction, it's contradiction. I have very little patience with those analyses now done by many people in critical pedagogy and others, which make me very, very nervous, which is it's all about reproduction. Marx was not a theorist of reproduction, it's a theorist of contradiction. Marx made many mistakes, one of them being the impregnation of his housekeeper. But we can hold that off for a little while, OK? You wanted to me to do this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you like to dance? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you'll, you'll forgive me, but I'm a bit be, being in all honesty, um, but this is, I, I'm conscious that this is the last day. <laughs> and I'm certain you know, that, um, that people are sort of, oh, it's a little tiring. It's the last day. But it's also, I, my last name is Apple. I spent many, many years teaching in regular schools and slums. And my first two years was as a teacher, uh, was as a substitute. So every day I'd call up at 6.15 and be told which school to go to. If you walk into a five-year-old classroom of kindergarten kids and you say, hello children, my name is Mr. Apple, <laughs> you better have a very juvenile sense of humor to survive. <laughs> So I don't mean to be cute about this, but I am aware of the time of day, but it is also part of a pedagogic style. Do not misinterpret the humor. This is deadly serious stuff, okay? Deadly serious stuff, okay. So showing spaces for action, neoliberalism provides openings as well as closings. So the question that I asked Gert yesterday was in recognition of that as an example. Neoliberalism says the following. We will change your identity so you think of yourself as a profit-maximizing individual where the world is a space in which you have choice. <laughs> Yet for people of African descent, for indigenous people who have been denied the idea of rationality, who are seen as being close to nature, right? therefore irrational and dangerous, Taking up that ideological moment, that identity, is partly counter-hegemonic. If it ends there with sort of this vision of democracy as possession of individualism, it's truly dangerous. But neoliberalism opens a space that can be reoccupied. So that's my point, and I'll come back to that later on. 
The third task is acting as critical secretaries. There are things going on that we must document. We have lost the collective memory of difference. And part of the task in many ways is to reassert the collective memory as truly collective and broaden what we mean by collective so that the stories of possibility and success are made visible. Otherwise, cynicism pervades. The fourth is keeping critical traditions alive critically. And I'll, again, I'll say more about each of these. We are not in a church, so we should not be worried about heresy. And the search for purity on the left is a disaster. I am tired of the debate between post and neo, structural versus post-structural. It's, I think, a useless debate, except at the level of having fun. Okay? And I think we should have intellectual enjoyment in doing this. Otherwise, why do philosophy? When I think there's, there, you know, there is joy in thinking seriously. That, too, is counter-hegemonic. Right? But I want us to spend more time in thinking about what we can learn from each other about that. I'm reminded of my grandfather's favorite joke, an old commie labor organizer, who said, Michael, when the left lines up in a firing squad, they always line up in a circle. <laughs> and that's true, okay? Yeah, so, okay? It's one of the reasons Graham Smith was brought in to the University of British Columbia, because of the tensions among First Nations, okay? So this, this is even among, even among oppressed groups. This is powerful. Okay. Then the fifth point is giving our expertise. That is, I think there is too, you know, I don't want us to have false modesty. We have sacrificed lives, brain cells, years to understand the world better, to assume that we have nothing to give back is exactly the wrong position to take epistemologically. It naturalizes daily life, and it assumes it's sort of natural that everyone understands what's going on, and that's not the case. So we must, in many ways, learn how to give this back. And I'll tell, I'll be a little richer in detail about that in a few minutes. Then the requirement of developing new skills. And here the model is Marx, aside from when he was poaching on his housekeeper. Um, and that is, learning to speak in multiple registers. This is complicated stuff. As the papers that have been presented have documented, this is hard work. It's hard intellectual work, it's hard emotional work, and it's dependent on years of understanding and connecting that understanding to daily life. So part of the task in many ways is also to make it clear. Now that third, I don't mean this in the therapeutic project, you know, but let us remember Austin's brilliant work on this about how to do things with words. That there are different linguistic traditions and different ways of speaking. Some language is used for mobilization, some for legitimacy, some for control, some for description. And we must find the different registers because the right in almost all our nations speaks in multiple registers and it does it extraordinarily well. And to the extent that we see our audience as only other professional philosophers and sociologists, that leaves vacant the space of the popular. And the right has been brilliant as intellectuals in occupying that space. All right? Okay. That actually makes our work even more important. It should go without saying that it should not simply be an intellectual effort in this sort of slightly odd vision of the intellect. Uh, that it should be connected to helping to build critical democratic communities in one's daily life. That is, of making certain that one is in a position to be criticized, to be talked, and to act in such a way so it's not just words coming out of one's mouth. And part of the argument that I'll build is, is on that. And it, I would hope that it also uh, goes without saying that practicing critical curriculum and teaching in our own teaching becomes crucial as well. The way in which that is coded, however, is, you know, it's, it's my worry about critical pedagogy. I have no idea what those words mean anymore. Okay? It can be anything from being nice to your students to saying it's up to you to teach yourself, okay? which I think is a magic trick. Okay? Right? 
though there are times I think that collective action of doing that is essential. Right? But there's almost as if the idea that teaching might sometimes be telling, in both senses at that time, by the way, has been lost. Uh, then, I'll say more about this because I want to draw from Bakhtin not living on the balcony. And this is in many ways uh, you know, to take a lesson from Pierre Bourdieu, reminding us powerfully that when the world's future is at stake, we must commit. Because not committing is a commitment. Right? There is no pristine space. Well, that's a bit posty, but it's also correct. We can talk about what I mean by correct later on. Okay. And then finally, and this is the one I added before, and that's when I looked around the room, opening up spaces for those who are not present. So who is in the room? Who is not in the room? Who needs to be in the room? Who needs to be our teachers? Okay. And that requires that we understand the way power relations work. So I'll give one example of that, and then I'll go back and develop the argument. In my own institution, the University of Wisconsin, Madison, because of neoliberal agendas, $250 million has been cut from the university budget over the last five years. We could trace exactly those kinds of proportions in England, in New Zealand, in Australia, in almost every nation represented in this room. Given that, we have to ask who gets to the university. The average family income of the people becoming teachers in my university now is $40,000 per year, more than it was a decade ago, in inflation-adjusted dollars. It's hard then to deal with the empire coming home when your experience of empire is the media and the positioning of people of color as either sexualized objects of male desire or as objects who somehow are drug dealers. Okay? So I want us to think about who has to be in that space to correct it. All right? Am I clear so far? Okay. Okay, that's it then. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what do I mean by describing reality truth? Illuminating the ways in which educational policy and practice are connected to relations, and these are not slogans uh, of exploitation and domination and to struggles against such relations in the larger society. These are technical words, and I'm drawing here, if you will, from Nancy Fraser's work in Unruly Practices and then in Justice Interruptus, when she argues that it is impossible to find any emancipatory project is, that does not combine the ethics and, pro and movements around redistribution with the ethics and movements around recognition. Okay. I'm reminded of that by the fact that among the first and most powerful commodities that established capitalism were black bodies. There would be no capitalism without misrecognition. Okay. So we know historically that that is the case. But it requires that we think of capitalism as a racializing project in the same way we think of it as a genderizing project in many ways as well. Okay? There's a brilliant book that's just been published by uh, Edward Batiste uh, called The Half Has Never Been Told, which is the history of the way in which capitalism literally built off of enslavement and that the very techniques of accountancy that we use now were developed over the growing of cotton by indigenous and enslaved people. So it seems to me that this becomes crucial to think about the politics of empire, but it requires that the categories that we use be broader and richer historically than they have. So then describing these things as you know, sort of jointly interconnected, then showing spaces for action, pointing to contradictions, the spaces of possible action, because its aim is to critically examine current realities with a conceptual and political framework that emphasizes the spaces in which counter-hegemonic actions can be and are now going on. So every time that neoliberalism or neoconservatism has an agenda, it opens spaces for action. I'll give one example of that. Neoliberalism requires new identities, desocializing ones. Okay, so schools then are placed on a market 
Parents make decisions about their own children. And supposedly, social justice will take care of itself. It's Adam Smith without Adam Smith. Okay, I think it's on page 313 of Wealth of Nations. Adam Smith says, for every one rich person, you need 500 poor ones. He was not very good in arithmetic. The, the metric is much higher than that. But it's a brilliant intuition about the structural requirements of wealth. Right? Well, under neoliberal agendas, we must see ourselves in many ways as constantly giving evidence that we are acting in entrepreneurial ways. In so doing, that is a desocializing ethic. Do not see yourself as connected. Yet there seems to be, seems to be, um, an inherent need for sociality among us. Who fills that space when sociality is destroyed? It can be filled with women's groups, be filled with counter-hegemonic anti-racist groups, it can be filled with families, it can be filled with the unions, the few of them that still exist in some nations. Okay? Or it can be filled with evangelical churches where we all go bowling together. Okay? So that space is created as a contradictory form. The question is, who fills it? And because I think of certain arrogance on the part of some parts of the left, uh, again, I, this is painful for me given who I am, I think that that space is not recognized. All right. Then acting as secretaries, expanding what counts as research and acting as secretaries, and I'm consciously using the word secretary, secretary as an intervention. Secretarial work is usually seen as women's paid labor. It is seen as de-skilled. It is constantly intensified. And I think that that model, rather than having the false notion that we are above it all, I think part of the task is also to act as secretaries to those groups of people and social movements who are now engaged in challenging existing relations of unequal power. This requires thick descriptions of critically democratic school practices. So in the new book, I talk about the one place where even when the right has, been gotten, has gotten back in power, critically democratic forms still dominate, and that's Porto Alegre, Brazil. So we can learn from the South, and the North, the ideological North, needs constantly to learn from the South. Or my most famous book that uh, is interesting, and that's me acting as with a group of people, not ideology and curriculum, this little book called Democratic Schools. A half a million copies of that have been sold. I don't mean that as a hymn to me. It is me going in with a tape recorder with Jim Bean and others saying, there's teachers right now doing unbelievable stuff. We need to document that before it is lost. Okay? So the task in many ways is to be the documentarians, the secretaries, the narrative analysts, the historians, to keep alive not the memory, though that's important, but to keep alive the very realities of counter-hegemonic struggle. Otherwise, the left creates puppets. And what we don't need is puppetry. What we need is a recognition that people say in complicated ways, whether it's Willis and the contradictory forms, whether it's McRobbie about women's contradictory lives, or whether it's the critical race theories attempt to say, look at the way in which race is funded in all our institutions, but people act back. Okay, clear so far? Okay, perhaps overly clear. Um, but then keeping critical traditions alive critically, keeping multiple traditions of critical work, both intellectual and practical alive, but supportively, uh, also supportively criticizing them when they are wrong or limited. So this is hard. I think that the way in which universities operate is to establish terrains of difference, to see yourself. It's what, what uh, not Benjamin Bloom, but Alan Bloom, a more interesting person, um, who said, all poetry is a debate with your mother and father. You must differentiate yourself from what was before. Post-structural and post-modern and some elements of neo-Marxism have very similar intuitions about an anti-reductive program. Yet the literature is filled with a debate over smaller things. So what we need to do in many ways is to see this 
you know, through a sorrow rather than fraternal way of can we engage in these debates while building unity. And that's exactly what the right has done. It is willing to compromise among its varied intellectual tendencies and philosophical tendencies to build a larger, what was then a counter-hegemonic movement and is now a truly hegemonic movement. So part of this, as I mentioned, is a recognition we are not in a church. We have a political and pedagogic agenda that requires constant debate, but a debate that doesn't leave blood on the table. It's why I fled ordinary language analysis. Somehow, its notion of language therapy also meant that you must be destroyed in public. Uh, I was good at it. And that worried the hell out of me. Okay? On the other hand, I do think that uh, the more sophisticated we are linguistically, the better we are as well. So there's a contradictory form in that. But again, part of this is to try and keep these traditions alive in a time when there's a loss of collective memory. So as an example, when I mentioned to my students how influential Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations was in my understanding of what is right and wrong with the tradition in which I was positioned, many of my students who are doing critical philosophy will say, who? That's actually very distressing in some ways because you cannot understand this tradition unless you understand where it comes from. Okay. Then giving our expertise, reconstructing the form and content of elite knowledge so that it serves genuinely progressive social needs and acting as organic intellectuals, avoiding arrogance by getting back the skills of critical educational analysis and action to communities. Now this is a complicated sentence. So I am a Gramscian in many ways, as some of you know. And part of the argument I want to make is that we are doing no one any favors to do the rhetorical analysis that says any form of knowledge that is now considered legitimate is by definition a form of domination. Right. I think that that's simply an incoherent statement and it's one of the world's worst overstatements. And because of the stuff I did in ideology and curriculum, I sort of helped a little bit in that misconception, but I would not want to do what Michael Young did in saying uh, we can forget about a partial relativizing project. But it is absolutely central, I think, to any epistemological project about the politics of knowledge as well, to understand that knowledge has, con has been contested, there have been victories, and we are not doing anyone any favor if we are, in fact, testing them on what counts as official knowledge and not giving them the pathways to know it. So the task is a Gramscian one, to take what now counts as legitimate knowledge, to reconstruct its ends and means so it is connected to daily life, but daily life not seen in this naturalizing way as if it's there, it's good. And any problem that comes from below must be solvable in the terms that are already generated from below. So that requires that we think in fairly sophisticated ways about what's wrong with a relativizing project and in what ways can we then expand what counts as elite knowledge and provide pathways to it at the same time as we deconstruct it. All right. Then the task whoops, is to give back that to the, to the community. Um, there's a five minute story, I'm noticing time, that I should tell now about, but I won't. That's a pity because it's really a very, very good story. Uh, but if there's time later on over something that is red and comes in a bottle, um, uh, I'm not meaning Coca-Cola. Okay? <laughs> Though my lecture is brought to you by Pepsi-Cola, so it's okay. Uh, that was a joke. Okay? Please laugh at that, at least. Okay, so. So part of our task is, again, to give these skills back. Otherwise, why are we doing it? Okay, that is, part of the issue of benefit is to say, can I make it clear enough to give it back? Then we must ask, for whom are we keeping these traditions alive? In what form? 
This requires relearning and developing and using multiple you know, skills with multiple groups, journalistic and media skills. Even though I have major worries about Zizak, he is brilliant at using the media. Right? So public philosophy becomes very interesting here. And can we be sophisticated and at the same time make these claims clear enough so that they make a difference in people's lives? And that requires that we learn again to speak in different registers without simplifying to the extent that it becomes simply the popular. And I don't think that those skills are as developed as they should be. Then, as I mentioned, building critically democratic communities in one's daily life, and what I mean by that is acting with progressive social movements and the policies their work supports, or movements against the assumptions and policies they critically analyze. Uh, you'll forgive me, but I think theory is best done in relationship to its object. So philosophy of education or sociology of education is not philosophers slumming or sociologists slumming to bring technical expertise to a field that they don't know a lot about. I would prefer that we engage in what Marx and others call praxis. And I think that is a rich tradition, that the best way to do philosophy is to engage with the object that we are philosophizing about. That's an epistemological tradition as well. And uh, I'll want to develop that later on. But uh, we're running out of time, so I'll have to speed up. Then there's 8, 9, and 10, the more interesting ones. Um, so I mentioned practicing critical curriculum and teaching in our, uh, in our own teaching. Uh, if I am doing philo a philosophy course with my students, or a social theory course, which is normally what I'm teaching, right? Um, if I talk in particular ways and then don't practice these things, it becomes not just banking, it actually becomes an object of derision. It is counterproductive in terms of the pedagogic form, but it also speaks epistemologically to whether I'm taking these kinds of knowledge forms seriously. Okay. More importantly, and I want to do tell something about this, and that is not living on the balcony. The board balcony has a very, very interesting genesis. And I need to say something about this right now because it has a class belongingness. The balcony as an architectural form is crucial when we're thinking about Mannheim's vision of the unattached intelligentsia. That somehow we are privileged because of the academic work we have done to stand above the social relations look out over them and say, I understand this. The balcony of the mind becomes a similar kind of thing. So my favorite book on this is a book by Bakhtin. I am less, I'm impressed but less influenced by his questions of intertextuality and linguistic forms and polysemia. I think his best work actually is a book called Rabelais and his and in Rabelais and his world, he traces out the history of carnival. And carnival arises in the sort of late medieval, early Renaissance periods in Europe, though it has a very different tradition in Africa and a much longer one within indigenous groups. But he's tracing it out in Europe. And he says the balcony comes about as capitalism begins to seize hold of the local and a new class formation arises. The new petty bourgeoisie begins to have numbers. And during Lent, when carnival is established, it is the one time of the year when people can talk back partly freely against dominance. So the king and queen of Belgium or France or Germany, Germany is complicated. It's the many, many leaders of these little pockets of what we now call Germany. Um, the, these bodies, these profane images, are paraded through the streets. The queen is given male genitalia. You squeeze the balloon, and rude sounds come from her rear end. And the king is given pendulous breasts. And similar things go on. Rude sounds go on. And for that one week, you can talk back to dominance. 
and what we would now call the new middle class, says, isn't that remarkable? And a new architectural form arises called the balcony. And our assumption was the balcony was a way that people could throw excrement and garbage out into the gutter. That is exactly only a small part of that. What it was was an architectural form that enabled the emergent middle class to stand above the profanity of talking back in the streets. It is a position not just architecturally, it is an identity position. And part of the argument I want to develop and can't hear, but it's developed in fairly rigorous ways in the new book, is to say our task is not to appropriate the balcony either as metaphor nor, you know, or as a position architecturally or as a mental position as well. We are positioned already. Then finally, and here again I must speak with great gratitude to Māori and other groups here for being my teachers about this. And that is opening up spaces for those not here. That is, who is not present? And that question is a collective question. Who is the we? What does the word we mean? Who needs to be part of the we? And in trying to answer that by rebuilding the collective forms by criticizing previous collective forms at the same time as one keeps them alive. That the task then is to find, if you will, not a utopian vision, but a vision that says part of our task is an architectural one, which is the creating a liminal space as well as a lived space in which the other is no longer the other, but is fully present. And in order to do that, the only way to engage with that is to engage with the world. Now these then, okay, I'll end with this. All of these tasks require collective as well as individual efforts. And I, for one, am not talented enough to do all of this. But that's the point. In order to do this, it is not the I, it is the we. Thank you.